Um, hello, everybody. This is Heather McCormick, uh, Youth Media Program Coordinator at the Somerville Media Center, and I am very excited to be joined by um, Lisa Ku, who is the Director of Early Education um, in Somerville, and who is um, here with us to kind of talk about how we navigate this strange new world um, with, with, with young people and particularly with, with younger children, with uh, preschool age or, you know, uh, children. And we hope to also have um, some follow-up conversations with folks from the city for resources um, for older children as well. But um, first of all, I would just like to ask you, how are you doing right now, Lisa? Um, hi, Heather. Thanks for having me on to talk about um, our, our little people, our youngest children in, um, in the city. Um, I'm doing well. Um, there's no shortage of work to be done, and I think that really helps um, with the day-to-day, -day, um, keeping extremely busy and feeling like we're contributing and helping. Um, but I think personally, just trying to get the comfortable with the unknown and knowing that there's so much that's not in our control and then figuring out what we actually can control and trying to prepare and help others prepare. Right. Um, so tell us a little bit about who you are and the role that you play uh, within the city as the director of early education. Sure. So I work for Somerville Public Schools where I oversee all of the preschool programming in the public schools, but I also oversee what's called the uh, Somerville Partnership for Young Children, which is our mixed delivery and mixed delivery really refers to the collaboration between public schools, Head Start programming, and child care centers all across the city. And the Somerville Partnership for Young Children, also known as SPYC, is coordinated by Alyssa Corrigan, who also works closely with me. And together we um, oversee all things preschool. Great. Yeah, so this is a tough time for, I think, uh, for everybody, obviously, um, but especially for parents uh, and for little kiddos and for teachers, right, who especially, you know, early education, these developmental years, they're very, very important. And so routine is very important and uh, structure is very important and the people that you're used to seeing in your life is very important. And so having so many of those routines be disrupted and things kind of shifted, um, can be a really challenging time. And then for parents, obviously, who are maybe juggling now working from home and, you know, trying to um, manage all the other things that they have to do, um, as well as now managing, you know, the education of small children in their house. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. We're asking a lot. Um, and uh, for teachers as well, who are now, you know, having to really innovate and think really quickly on our feet about how can we still deliver you know, high quality programming when we can't be uh, together in person. So all that is to say, like, you know, we know that these uh, programs have been closed, they will be closed for the foreseeable future. And, you know, everyone's kind of navigating this new world of remote learning, um, play and socialization. So what do you think, what are some of the ways that you've seen families maybe um, being challenged by this, but also like adapting to this context? Uh, there's been some great adaptations, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But um, the you know the challenges are are sort of just what you described. Sort of parents having their own pressures of having to work and adjust to their own remote work schedules, and then trying to maintain some semblance of order and routine for their children at home. I think one thing that we've seen um, families needing to shift on is feeling like they have to do it all, that they have to replicate the school day um, within the confines of their home and they can't do it and they shouldn't do it. They shouldn't try and do it. And I, I'm hoping that this messaging will help alleviate any guilt or pressure that pa parents of young children have to try and replicate what happens in their child's um, education and care situations. So we, want, we wanted to just help parents to know that right away. Um, the routines that families have at home um, that are their usual routines, keeping those as similar as possible and then 
putting in some of those learning experiences into those regular times of day are important because kids need to be on their same sleep schedules. Um, sleep is probably really disrupted right now with um, people being at home, lack of quiet, more people in the house. And so that's a struggle um, for families, but as best they can, that's what we're really recommending is to make sure children have a quiet place to sleep and that they are getting a good balanced diet. And even though we're asking kids to be on screens more because that's how you and I are communicating right now and that's how kids are communicating with the outside world, to really, really watch the content. We know that there are kids snuggled up with adults watching adult content and we think they're not getting it and if it's scary and inappropriate it's actually going to heighten their anxiety and then parents are going to see more behavioral issues so um so so those are some of the challenges people are facing the adaptations that folks are making are to um things where we've seen uh, folks be really successful are when they um take off small bites. So if your child has been in a child care center or a program um, or in um, a school setting, teachers are sending home and giving access to lots of resources, which we can talk about later, um, but not feeling like, oh my gosh, I have this whole menu of things and I have to do all seven this morning between 11 and one o'clock, knowing that actually 15 minutes of really high quality interaction um, or an activity that then a child can do on their own later is better than a tired child who is not going to be engaged and you and end up tussling with. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about um, that high quality engagement, that those types of interactions that we're talking about? Because I think that, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, parents think like, oh, what teacher, I need to teach them academics or I need to replace like these other pieces that they're missing from, you know, traditional school where it's like, actually, you can get some really enriching, really positive learning um, hap that can be done based in, like you said, these small, high quality interactions at home. Do, could you give us a few examples of what that could look like? Sure. Um, making a grocery list is a really good one. People are thinking about that all the time now. Um, a lot of us are doing it online, um, but we have to prepare before we go out. And as you do that, having a small piece of scratch paper can be anything and having your child watch you do it or sit or ask them to draw pictures of things that you are thinking about getting at the store. And ha that's a, a really great pre-writing or what we call a mark making experience for children. Um, so doing that alongside you is something that helps them feel like they're contributing and are part of the household. Writing down their stories is another really easy thing that you can do. Um, looking at a picture, telling a story, having a child draw, acting something out, and then having you write it down so that it's something you can read back to them later. Those are just two quick examples, but then also um, pull up a stool and have your child join you at the sink while you're washing dishes. Get a tub, fill it with soapy water, put them right next to you, and they're learning about volume and shapes and sizes of things as they're pouring and developing those kinds of skills. A sponge to squeeze to develop hand strength. Those are all important learning experiences that in the classroom um, children are doing as well, but in a different sort of format. And so it has to be woven into your daily life um, in ways that are easy for families to do. Yeah. That's great. Those are great examples. Um, so what about for frontline personnel, essential personnel who um, are doing just an incredible, an incredible thing right now um, and risking their lives and having to work um, to keep the rest of us safe? Um, there is currently, I believe, not an approved family or out of school time child care site in Somerville. Um, so what can families do who do need access to this kind of care? So if you go to mass.gov website, even if you just Googled emergency child care Massachusetts, I just did it before we came on, it comes right up and there's a locator, a map locator that you can use, put your zip code in or look at a map of the state and you can find out exactly where these emergency child care sites are that were set up in the days after March 23rd very quickly. Most of them are, um, I think almost all of them are 
existing sites that then apply to become an emergency site. And these sites only serve people who are in essential professions. So healthcare, public health, law enforcement, people who are working in energy, food, agriculture, uh, public works, essential government folks, critical- Grocery stores, yeah grocery stores, transportation. And so, um, but what I, what I noticed and I um, uh, talked to some people at EEC yesterday is that um, they're not highly enrolled. You would think that they would be flooded, but there are actually over 900 sites across the state. Um, there are three in Cambridge. There are, uh, I think is one in Melrose, YMCA. Um, so there's some within our region, but we don't have any particularly in Somerville right now. Um, but again, there are some close by. And um, there are uh, only 16% um, uh, capacity right now. Oh, wow. So um, there are some places where they have all their slots full, and most of those are small family child care that would only um, care for five or six children anyway. But the larger sites have room. So if people go, and so we think people don't know about them yet, yeah. or folks have made other plans. So if one parent is not working, um, or they've been able to stagger their schedules, um, then children are being cared for in the home. Yeah. Um, but there's plenty of space in the sites in the Boston metro area. That's great to know. Yeah, thank you for that update. Sure. Um, so what about the resources within the city? What kind of resources are being made available to help support families but, and young children, but also young people um, during this crisis? Sure. Um, the superintendent puts out uh, of Somerville Public Schools, Mary Skipper, puts out a bulletin three times a week, and that bulletin is specifically about resources for families um, who may need um, food, um, and there's food distribution happening at through the Somerville Public Schools on Monday, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays from nine to eleven um, at um, various sites, and. Um, uh, in, within her bulletin, she also talks about uh, ways to get diapers, um, necessities that people need. Um, we work with um, the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative, which is the family engagement arm of the Somerville Public Schools. And from prenatal through youth, um, they have all kinds of resources for families. So looking at the SFLC website on the Somerville Public Schools page will get you to lots and lots of resources for families. Uh, within the early childhood world, we, um, in the Somerville Public Schools Early Ed Department, built out our website, um, www.somervilleearlyed.com, uh, and that's also on the Somerville Public Schools website, along with SFLC, and that has lots of um, things to do at home with, with um, children, so for people who um, maybe don't have a teacher who's providing information for them about what to do, um, they can look at that website. The city's Office of Economic Development um, also has some amazing resources on it. If you are um, a family, but you also have a small business, there are resources there for you about um, small business loans, etc. So um, the city is putting out and updating their website daily with information. Um, so there's lot, no shortage, I think, of information out there from the city of Somerville. The Department of Health and Human Services and Summer Promise also have put out important information. Um, what about remote programming? Are you guys currently running like remote programs for, for young children or, um, or, for, or for any age group that you'd like to yeah, talk about? There's, there's actually remote pro programming happening from, from infants all the way up through adult learners. So um, oh. Somerville Family Learning Collaborative actually has remote play groups. So they're continuing their play groups online um, and children just love being able to see each other on the screen. Um, the, in early education, as, as I said before, our, the teachers in Somerville are, are putting out live sessions and pre-recorded sessions with ways for children to interact um, remotely. And then in the K-12 world, um, the mobilization of what's happening in terms of making sure children are having 
high quality learning experiences has been stunning. And many in the yeah. state are looking to Somerville um, and the Somerville Public Schools for birth through adult learners as an example, because we were able to mobilize so quickly and get content out there. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I'm really uh, excited myself to dip my my toe into remote learning next week for April vacation. So, um, which by the way, there are a lot of resources and a lot of programs that are coming out with um, specific targeted programs for those er older ages um, during April vacation. So, if this um, is on TV tomorrow, then that will still be relevant. <laughs> the other thing, um, Heather, to note is that there are um, many families who still don't have any kind of connectivity or devices. Um, they're trying to do this on their phones, which is, can be really, really hard now that we're relying on tablets and um, computers. So uh, the district, if we again go back to the uh, updates from Mary Skipper and from the, to the Somerville Public Schools website, which you can see quickly on your phone, um, if please contact the district if you need a Chromebook, if you don't have internet connectivity, um, contact the city or you can probably call 311 um, and that will um, come to um, or 211 um, and that will come to the city uh, so that we can get connectivity. Oh. We're working on that for to get that for families. Yeah, I saw that there was a Comcast package that was going to be made available to families in several public schools uh, for free. So that's that's fantastic. And I think those resources are absolutely critical, right? Um, because equity in education is always a, always a challenge. And actually, I mean, that just to, you know, piggyback off of that, like, we are going to, what do you anticipate in terms of potential learning loss or how are we, um, how do you think we might be able to, um, you know, move forward? I guess it's, it's so hard to predict the future at this moment, but what are some of the ways, I guess it goes back to your initial kind of things of like ways that you can learn at home, but trying to prevent that learning loss. What are some ways that we can try to um, not make that gap wider between um, high socioeconomic kids and low SES kids in, in the city? I think it really goes back to those short, small, high quality interactions that we have with children. Um, thinking about children's ability to become independent learners, this is actually an opportunity for that to happen for children. And um, if they have a small experience where they're starting to learn and be comfortable with holding a mark making tool, or again, that experience of, of doing a drawing and telling a story and engaging in written uh, and expressive language at home will really go a long way with young children in helping them to be prepared and ready for kindergarten. Kindergarten will look different in the fall. Um, it, it just will be in terms of meeting the developmental needs. Um, the good news about young children is that they're still, their brains are still very elastic and, um, and we talk a lot about neuroplasticity and being able to overcome uh, challenges and um, develop resilience. And so we're gonna have to think about our curriculum as a way to support that as children come back to school and we're already planning for that. That's great. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, thank you so much, Lisa. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Um, if you want to just quickly remind everybody of where they can find these resources, we're going to have all this stuff pop up on the screen and all of that. But And also any, any advice you'd give maybe to, to parents of young kids, um, to teachers, um, any, any closing thoughts that you want to share with us here? Sure. I mean, I think one day at a time is really a message that's going to help us right now and that any kinds of behaviors or things that you see on one given day are not an indicator of how that child's life is going to be. I think that's a general rule of, of thumb with parenting um, because your child is uh, having a meltdown or having a tantrum in that moment doesn't mean that that's how it's always going to be. And that being there for your kids and capitalizing on those small interactions um, and then just trying to take care of yourselves it really is that old um, saying of put your you know oxygen mask on first and so the adults have to 
have to breathe and take care of themselves and do the best they can because parents are working really hard right now and we know it's not easy. So um, that will go a long way in creating some calm and some, some routine and consistency at home. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Again, I really appreciate you coming on to chat with us and um, you can find out more information uh, about the department, the Somerville Early Education uh, by going to SomervilleEarlyEd.com. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, Somerville, SomervilleEarlyEd.com, a uh, bunch of resources there. Also, um, Summer Promise, uh, the online um, guide. There's going to be more information coming out about April vacation, so stay tuned for that. Um, and make sure that you're on these lists if you are a parent, if you, um, you know, are uh, working with young people in the city, make sure you're getting um, information from the superintendent from the, uh, from the city of Somerville, um, because we want to make sure that everybody does have access to these resources um, and knows about them. So Facebook yeah. pages are actually another good way for people to stay in touch with what's going on. If you can like the city of Somerville or Mayor Joe Carter Tony's Facebook page, he has updates daily throughout the day on his page and the Somerville Public Schools. Um, I've actually found that that's a great way for me to find out what's going on in the city. Yeah, that's a great I, that's a great um, suggestion. And also sign, signing up for city alerts. Um, we do try to put out those alerts on, um, on our TV station as well in a timely way, but um, you can get them right away. You can get phone calls. <laughs> I've gotten plenty of phone calls. I don't even live in Somerville anymore. I'm getting all the phone calls. But, um, but again, uh, thank you so much for everything that you're doing and especially for that message of, you know, take a deep breath one day at a time we are truly in this together. It's not necessarily the same for all of us, for sure, but that, um, you know, everyone's having to navigate this and we're doing the best that we can. And right now that's, that's more than good enough. So, um, so thank you so much, Lisa, for being thank on with us today. Me, Heather. Take it easy um, yourself and um, uh, have a great day. Thank you. All right, everybody. And thank you again for tuning in. Uh, this is Heather McCormick, uh, Somerville Media Center. Uh, signing off. Take care.